So uh, this is a bit, going to be a bit participative, so I need a show of hands. Who's got hands? Uh, okay, about 90% of the audience have hands. That's great. That's a good start. Um, some words. Some words like faster, smarter, sooner, cleaner. That's to me what the future is all about. Future is continuously speeding up. It's arriving sooner than we think. This little device is really the icon of change for the last decade. This thing's only 10 years old and yet most of us have it. In fact, here's another participative part. Who has a smartphone in the audience? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, most of the audience, anybody that's still got a flip phone? There's usually one, but I can't see one today. That's okay, awesome. We must be mostly millennials. Uh, and then anybody got a copper network in their pocket? No, copper networks. Copper networks have passed on. When we actually move through technology, there's always technology entries, there's always technology entrance, uh, exits. Uh, and if I can look at this little device and think about, you know, what can I do with it? I can look at my map, I can get the weather, I can take a photo, I can make a video, I can make a tweet, I can play Pokemon Go. Should I stop doing that? Oh, perhaps I should. Um, oh, I can make a phone call. It's extraordinary. It's a device that can make a phone call. It's battery operated. This is what the 21st century is actually about. It's about convergence. It's about all the devices, all the things that we do in one place. And it's also about being mobile. But something about being mobile is particular, and that means we have to have a battery. And that battery is going to be fundamental to everything we do, whether it's on a mobile phone or driving a motor car in the future or operating our house or operating our hospitals. Batteries are going to be fundamental. How do we know this? How do we know that new technologies emerge this way? So the first thing that we'll do is look at how does technology emerge into, uh, into the future? We've got a, uh, a yellow line that describes the emergence of technology and the uptake of technology, and the blue line shows the accumulation of that yellow line. Uh, so in an audience like this, uh, we've got uh, a, an oversupply of seats. Unfortunately, we haven't got the whole theatre full, but actually that means that we've got an opportunity to continue to grow the market for bums on seats. That's terrific. So that's how we can measure stuff. And as we actually build up in this Economics 101, we see that the first part of an emerging market generally is expensive. The people that bought smartphones in 2007 are probably paying, were probably paying more than they did in 2018, although sometimes when you buy the Model X, you don't know if that's true or not. However, uh, the next part of that is that as more of us buy these devices, they get cheaper, their volume goes up, the scale of production goes up, and as a consequence, things get cheaper. The more of things we make, the cheaper they get. Uh, and that is where the, most of the rest of us start to buy a device. And when we buy devices, the result of that is that we then see an exit of the device. Uh, the old copper network's gone. The flip phone is being replaced to the smartphone. We can actually take this model and apply it to anything that we buy, whether it's an idea, whether it's, whether it's a coffee, whether it's a solar panel or a TV set or a motor car. All of these rules apply, it's just Economics 101. We can measure the way these devices get taken up in the past and we can make some assumptions about that take up as to how devices will be taken up in the future. So we then think about what's next. What's been taken up in a big way in the most recent past, and that is renewable energy. We've got a blue line on the graph for world energy capacity of wind, and we've got a yellow line on the graph for the uptake of solar on the planet. And we can see that wind's been taken up really quickly. That's, that's a really exciting graph. That's a fairly steep uptake curve. That's what we'd love to see for renewable energy. And solar, we can see solar coming in a bit later than wind. It's a different technology. In fact, what we're going to see into the future as we move forward is a step change in the way that this technology is taken up. And what looked like a really fast uptake of wind and solar is going to be supplanted by an even faster uptake of wind and solar into the future. But we'll also get some technology replacement. Solar will become more important than wind. That's okay. Technology replaces technology all the time. What we also see is that that uptake is accompanied by batteries. Uh, and we know that sun doesn't shine all the time. We know that wind doesn't, doesn't blow all the time. But if we tie that to the arrival of batteries, then we actually start to reach a point where we can actually manage reliability, we can manage security of supply. And the other thing that's independent on, is, is seen on this graph is, and we're increasing volume all the time. 
And with volume increase comes a reduction of cost. Every time we double manufacturing of an item, whether it's a TV set or a solar panel, we reduce manufacturing costs by about 18%. It's a, it's a rough average, but it can be down as low as eight or 10, it can be up as high as 26%. If you're actually doubling, more than doubling, if you're tripling, quadrupling, actually multiplying by eight, the number of um, um, amount of stuff you're making, then you're reducing cost in the same way. And if we go and see, look at this graph, we can see uh, the red line of uh, declining cost, and we can see the yellow line of increasing volume of solar. We actually know that this has been happening. We're going to expect to see the same with batteries. And so we've now got batteries on the screen. There we go, that's excellent. We've got batteries. Batteries are just emerging though. We've actually been building batteries for a long, long time. We've had them in these devices. We've had them in the devices that came before them like the flip phones. Uh, we didn't have batteries in the copper network. We didn't need them. This is a new century. This is a new century of distributed everything, distributed information, distributed energy generation from rooftops of solar. Uh, and we're actually seeing how that, uh, that same model for the iPhone, the same model for the smartphone is in fact applying to renewable energy. So we move on to the next graph and we think about, now this one's complicated, so I'm gonna talk about this one just a little bit. Uh, the dotted lines you can see are the, still the growth rates. In this case, not a global cumulative growth rate, but an annual growth rate of each of the technologies. We've got lots of wind coming in, we've got solar coming in, we've got batteries coming in. The big columns are how much we spend on energy. Uh, in renewable sector. And you'll see that it actually peaked in about 2015. We spent a bucket load of money putting renewable energy onto the planet. Not many batteries at that point, just a tiny little whisper. Um, but since that point, scale and volume has helped us. Since that point, we've actually been seeing, and you can see on those graphs from about that point forward, the amount we're spending on wind and solar is getting lower. But the dotty lines are getting higher. While we're spending less on building renewable energy, we're actually building more renewable energy. When batteries come in, we're gonna start spending a little bit more again, but it will too will peak and then start to slide down. We can see the combination of the arrival of wind and solar is now being accompanied by the reduction of cost to the point where we are going to start to start to see the production of energy to be reaching a point where it's almost free. Not completely free, but almost free. And in fact, far cheaper in the next decade than any energy has been in the last 100 years. And that's really quite extraordinary. Even with the addition of batteries and the expenditure that we're going to do on batteries to actually allow us to make more use of renewable energy reliably, even that will get cheaper with time. So, we, so this is what that graph says. There's a whole range of paradigms that are changing. I, I started with faster, smarter, sooner and cleaner. The cleaner part is the renewable energy. The faster part is how we build stuff, whether it's an iPhone or whether it's a, uh, a power station. What we're getting to is technologies that roll out instead of being large, big, big beasts. They're actually modular. They're actually assembled. They're actually delivered faster. If we want to build a nuclear power station, we've got to get planning approvals. We've got to build a resource. We've got to get uranium out of the ground. We've got to get a banker's approval. And then after we get all those sorts of things happening, we can then start to think about how we commission a nuclear power plant. I'm not advocating this here, I'm just explaining it. Um, and so what you see is that all that process for a nuclear power plant takes a long, long time. If I wanna build a solar farm, I've got the sun shining, what I need to do is get my financial clothes on my plant so that I can be, then build a solar farm. And it's modular, it's in a kit from Ikea, it's a kit from Bunnings. I can just build this thing up and actually start to produce it. If I tell an investor I've got $300 million I want to spend uh, to build a power plant, uh, and, but actually if you want to build a nuclear power plant, you've got to wait 10 years until you get your money back. Or if I want to build a power station from solar, after two years, we're going to be producing power, we're going to be making revenue, and your investment is starting to be paid back. 10 years or two years, which would you choose? I know where I'm going, I'm building a solar farm. And the reason for that is because this is the way that we're going to generate energy in the future. This is the way it's going to be cheaper into the future. So faster, sooner, next slide, we'll see, and more of it. What we've actually seen is a transition globally already in the production of energy on the planet. In 2015, for the first time, the world built more renewable energy capacity in power plants than in fossil fuel generation. How many people actually knows that? This is, this is extraordinary. 
Uh, reverse question. Who didn't know that? Because I didn't see any hands. Yeah, nobody knew it. OK, here we are. Now, that part's extraordinary in itself. But there's another part that I've, we've just talked about, and that is that it takes me six or eight years to build a coal-fired power station and it takes me two years to build a, um, a solar farm. Now, when it appears on that graph is when it opened, not when I started building. So the, co the fossil fuels that are on that graph, we made decisions to build six and eight years ago. In 2011, 2010, we made a decision to build a coal-fired power station that's only opening six or eight years later. It's only just appearing on that graph as coming out the other end of the, of the production cycle. Whereas the solar farms that we've decided to build, two or three years ago we decided to build, and they're appearing on this graph already. We can already see the decline in fossil fuels. That decline in fossil fuel new capacity happened six or eight years ago because that's when we decided to build. It's just that they're coming out the gate now. So there's already a two levels of extraordinary change on that graph. Let's keep moving on, because otherwise we'll run out of time. But the agencies in the world that are responsible for telling us how change is happening, in my view, really don't get it right. These are comparing graphs, these lines here are comparing graphs of projections from the International Energy Agency, which are all these flat lines on the bottom, uh, with uh, the real data that actually happened. When the International Energy Agency was forecasting in 2004 and 2006 and 2008 where they thought renewables would go, they showed us a flat line into the future. They couldn't imagine that this is disruptive change. They couldn't imagine this was logarithmic growth. They couldn't imagine that this is going to be a fast production. Well, that was up until then, 2009. Maybe they learnt from that experience. But if we have a look, it got worse. This, is, this stuff's never going to succeed, they thought. This stuff is never going to be how we build it. Uh, it's really extraordinary that, that agencies that are responsible for telling us what energy looks like globally have completely got it wrong. If we move to this next slide, uh, this is another graph from another agency from the Energy in, um, Information Administration from the USA who forecast what they think energy change in the future will be like. They're all flat lines. There's no disruptive change. There's no logarithmic growth and exit of old technology. That's nuts, because that's not how technology works. We know we get market entries, and when we do, we get market entrance, exits. So we've got to actually think about how that change happens. So let's step forward and think about uh, where that might go. Why is it going to be so fundamentally different to the last 100 years? The next five years will be way different from the last 50. The next 10 years, way different to the last 100. Here we have something we're familiar with, the production TV sets. Uh, we produce about 250, 300 million TV sets a year. We're all buying them. They're TV sets, I think you've seen them before. They're these big black things, they're flat. They come out of a factory. Uh, they're a consumer item. They're something that we buy regularly uh, on, on a white appliance goods sort of cycle. What if we compare that to how we're consuming solar panels? And what we discover is that a couple of years back, the world started making more solar panels than TV sets devices that consume power are being replaced by devices that produce power. But more than that, they produce power for us. They produce power on our rooftops. Last century, we'd have to go down the road and write a contract with the energy utility so that we could get electricity into our house. This century, we make it ourselves. This century, it's distributed. This century, we own the power that we generate. That's an extraordinary change. We've turned energy from being something that a large institution has to sell us to something we just own, to something we just produce. It's just a consumer item. It's an extraordinary change in the energy market. So we think about how things change and go to the next slide. We see that instead of a linear projection into the future, which is what happens with stuff that doesn't work, we're getting a logarithmic growth into the future. The opportunity that sits in that marketplace, in this case for energy, is that there's a lot of people that don't think we're going to get there. And the people that are going to be those that take advantage of this opportunity are the ones that occupy the space in between those two lines. So we move on and think about, uh, OK, so if I'm right, if what I'm saying is true, if markets in the future change in exactly the same way that markets in the past did, that we get new market entrants and we get exits of markets, then what does that graph that previously the Energy Information Administration suggested might look like as a flat line in the future? What does that look like from my point of view? We've got the growth of renewables in green. It started, it's actually doing really exciting, but it's getting even better. 
next decade is going to be bigger than this decade. There's no doubt. As a consequence of that, we're already squeezing coal. Coal's already exiting. I showed you the graph. We're actually seeing the exit of coal capacity on the planet. It's happening. We're measuring it. It's not me making numbers up. It's real data. So we've got the exit of coal happening in brown here and the dotty line, an exit of technology. Uh, we've also got a squeeze on uh, oil as we start to build electric vehicles. In the next couple of years, we'll start to see pressure on oil, and by about 2022, 2023, we should see the decline of oil as a consequence of an electric car fleet replacing a petrol fleet. And then finally, we'll also see some pressure on gas into the future. But the one thing that's certain is that future markets will be different to past markets, and this is what this graph really shows. We're almost there. If we add up all of the energy we use, we get the total blue line at the top. And amongst the things that change is energy efficiency. We'll see a growth in energy consumption, but we'll also see an improvement in energy efficiency. Why? Because we're going more and more to battery storage. We know how to manage energy on our phone. We know that when the battery's low, we can't use it. And when we have more batteries, we're already pre-adapted to using batteries. We'll know how to manage the energy in our motor car in the same way and in our houses in the same way that will drive efficiency of consumption that I think will actually ultimately lead to a decline in the energy consumption. And that's also going to be driven by renewables. The really exciting thing in my mind is this last graph. As we increase the use of renewables and we improve efficiency, what that does translate to is a change in carbon emissions. We will see a natural exit of fossil fuels. It is happening already, we're measuring it. It will continue to happen because that's the way that economies work and that's the way that technology replaces one technology with another. The consequence of that for climate change is fantastic. It means that we will actually, maybe accidentally, but nevertheless, inevitably, we are going to deal with carbon emissions. We're going to fix climate change. Whether it's soon enough, I'm not going to talk about, uh, but the fact is we're on the right trajectory. There's three things that we need to finish with. The change is happening. We're, it's real. We're measuring it. The potential for change is there, and we just need to continue to actually push forward and push against those that say, this change will cost us. No, this change will save us. So the future is ours. We really just need to take hold of it and ensure that we can deliver on the optimism that's possible from the data that we see. Thanks for listening. <laughs>